Welcome to this recording of the Activist Lawyer Podcast, brought to you from the Granite Podcast Studio in the heart of Newry City. We are delighted that you could join us at Activist Lawyer, where we will be discussing a range of topical matters engaging not only with lawyers, but people who are committed to highlighting and combating injustices and inequalities. We will bring you our thoughts, but invite you to share yours. We'll be looking for contributors to our blog at activistlawyer.com, as we want your perspective as we unravel and unpack a host of issues. My name is Sarah Henry, and I'm a solicitor practicing in Uri City. I worked with a human rights firm in Dublin for many years, and with a number of rights-based organisations and charities. I'm looking forward to meeting some fantastic guests throughout this series. And today I am delighted to be joined by solicitor Rosemary Connolly. Hi, Rosemary. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Thank you for asking me. Not at all. So we'll be discussing uh, core areas of Rosemary's work, primarily relating to employment and equality matters, as well as this year marking the 50th anniversary of the introduction of the Equal Pay Act. So just a little bit of information about Rosemary. Rosemary graduated from Queen's University Belfast with an honours degree in law and obtained her Certificate of Pro- Professional Legal Studies in 1983. Rosemary holds a Master's in Human Rights and Discrimination Law from Queen's and a Diploma in Organisation and Manpower Studies also from Queen's. She has also undergone advanced advocacy training and is a panel member of the Law Society of Northern Ireland's approved list of mediators. Prior to establishing her own specialist employment and equality law practice in Warren Point, Rosemary was Director of Legal Services with the then Fair Employment Commission, with overall responsibility for the exercise of its legal case law duties and formulation of legal strategy. She is a former board member of the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland and a former legal commissioner with the Charity Commission for Northern Ireland. She's currently president of the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal and she's a regular contributor on BBC Northern Ireland Radio on topical matters in the field of employment and equality law. Wow, so no better person to have on today, Rosemary, to discuss these matters. (laughs) Thank you for that kind introduction. (laughs) It's a a reminder of how old I am, (laughs) apart from anything else. How experienced (laughs) you are. This is fantastic. So it's great to have, have you here, Rosemary, today as a guest, but also, I mean, the, the areas that we're going to look at today are very, very topical um, and very relevant in, in the current climate um, for a number of reasons. But firstly, would you mind maybe letting our listeners know a little bit more about your background as a leading employment and equality solicitor in UK and the cu- current areas of work that you're um, looking at at the moment? Yeah, sure. So um, very early on uh, in my uh, a career as a lawyer, I had the great good fortune, I, I always uh, say, to um, be appointed to a role with what was then the Fair Employment Commission for Northern Ireland. Now, the Fair Employment Commission arose out of the Fair Employment Act of 1976, which was an act uh, adre- uh, aimed at addressing the continuing and pervasive inequality, uh, particularly in employment opportunity, as between the Protestant and Catholic, what we, call the two, what we then called the two main communities in Northern Ireland. And its sister organisation was the Equal Opportunities Commission, um, dedicated to the elimination of discrimination on gender grounds. Mm-hmm. Um, subsequently, of course, those two organisations and uh, the organisation dealing with disability discrimination were subsumed into what we now have, which is the Equality, Equality Commission, Commission for Northern Ireland, with I the see. broad remit across all of the sort of the, sort of the protected grounds but uh, when when I uh, when I joined the commission um, it was very much at a period of change the 1976 act had been in place um, by by that stage for for a decade and it was exhortative in nature in, in other words it appealed to the the good nature of employers to do the right thing basically mm-hmm. and to work towards the elimination of discrimination but repeated studies um, had shown that really the degree of inequality was pervasive and persistent. And so, I, I, as I say, I was fortunate en- enough to be there uh, during the phase when the regime became toughened and strengthened. And in particular, um, complaints of unlawful discrimination um, on grounds of religious belief, political opinion, moved out of a kind of in-house, non-transparent form and out into the mainstream body of tribunals in Northern Ireland. And that really had a major impact because it meant that uh, where there were acts of unlawful discrimination, those could be adjudicated upon in a fully public tribunal in a public manner. Mm-hmm. and. 
um, you know, a lot of cases did come before the tribunals in those early days, which gave the tribunals an opportunity to, to interpret the law, mm-hmm. to lay down general principles uh, of widespread application. And personally, I think if, if you look out at the landscape today at a, mm-hmm. at a 20, 25 year remove, um, you, you know, I don't think anyone would argue with the contention that as far as uh, religious or political discrimination in the workplace goes, it's much less obvious um, prevalent than, than it once was. Unfortunately, you can't say the same for other forms of discrimination, but I think mm-hmm. that would have to be acknowledged in that particular field. So having been there for <coughs> just under a decade, I um, then took the decision to set up my own um, uh, employment and equality practice. Um, I'm a local person and <laughs> I thought we're better than, than Warren Point, that great no, centre of, <coughs> of commercial life. But um, I have to say I'm there 25 years now and I, I'm obviously very biased, but I, I happen to think there's nowhere better in the entire world <laughs> that you could uh, spend your life working. Fantastic. Yeah. And you're still very much involved, Rosemary, I suppose, outside of work um, in terms of um, progressing matters around equality and employment. And I know just from seeing you on LinkedIn and various, you're hosting a number of webinars yes. with other practitioners as well. So it's fantastic that you're still able to, you know, um, contribute your expertise to the public at large. And I think these days in particular, um, employment seems to be really up there um, with one of the key practice areas yes. because of COVID. Have you noticed your own areas of work maybe expanding a little to cover new emerging areas? Yes, uh, undoubtedly. I mean, employment law <coughs> is an area of law where because it is a, it, because it um, covers so much of, of, of an individual's life and working life because there are so many aspects to it, particularly in the quality field, mm-hmm. looking at all the protected grounds. It was always mm-hmm. an ever a, a dynamic area of law. I mean, you might get areas of law where very little changed in 10 years. That was never the case with empl- mm-hmm. employment lawyers. Well, no, you've got to keep right up there with developments in European law, developments across the water, even persuasive authorities from, uh, fr- 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 from the Republic. But with the onset of the pandemic, um, employment law rights and entitlements has been, you, you know, thrown into really sharp mm-hmm. focus. Um, we had the um, coming into being a furlough, a c- concept that none yeah. of us uh, couldn't pronounce it at the start, never <laughs> mind know what it meant. And, uh, y- y- you know, um, that has uh, obviously impacted lots and lots and lots of people, whether it's the a uh, the, the, the being placed on furlough, the not being placed on furlough, the uncertainty of when you are on furlough, um, it, uh, you, you know. But in general terms, um, when you have threats, uh, as and the, the pandemic is an existential threat, threat to, yeah. to to employment generally, when you have those and periods of uncertainty, people look to their rights and entitlements yeah. um, that bit more, which is entirely understandable. So we have been mm. very busy. And you can see maybe coupled with COVID, coupled with Brexit as well. I mean, we're coming close to the end of the transition period now on the 31st of December. And I just know myself from an immigration perspective, employers before the pandemic hit. So earlier this year, the talk was about how to retain their current EU workers and how the new points-based systems around visas were really going to impact then. Mm -hmm. Then COVID happened, but that matter is still on the table. And you can see the stress and anxiety around that, especially in Northern Ireland. We're so used to migrant workers and the ease and the transition of free movement. And that to suddenly come to an end is really quite something for employers to get to grips with as well, especially in manufacturing and food processing and all of that. So it's a tough time, I suppose, for employers. Yes, and I I, I know that you uh, have uh, blogged quite a lot on that and, and put up helpful guidance. And uh, you can only you can only feel for employers yeah. because um, it, it is really a cliff edge scenario as you say in terms of so many detailed requirements uh, around the status of migrant workers mm-hmm. and so much left completely unknown, unknown. and in, in fact uh, I, I think people are getting tired of the exhortations to get 
Brexit ready whenever yeah. it, it's fine as a slogan, mm-hmm. but uh, the, the details not the there. Details get ready for there. what? Get re- you know you can only get ready if you know what you're getting ready for. Yeah, and we actually spoke to Home Office officials recently that said, well, employers have had four years to get their head around this, and you're thinking, well, no, because you've only just recently introduced the changes you know that they were waiting for for four years so that's a very unfair statement so really and especially since we are on the the land border here you know our competitor is right beside us and it's you know so there's that um kind of stress level as well whether to relocate or you know so it is a difficult time but just as well on that i suppose rosemary with covid um you know presenting challenging times for all of us and we've heard a lot about um how it has impacted criminal uh, lawyers and the whole judiciary and the process there. In terms of employment tribunal, can you maybe comment on how pandemic and the the act and the restrictions and regulations around COVID has impacted practice, Mm -hmm. I suppose, and your clients Mm -hmm. potentially? In a a very real um, and unfortunately uh, adverse way, sir, in that with the initial onset of the pandemic, the the, there was a practice direction which issued from the tribunals which said um, that all matters that were listed between, effectively between March and the end of June were, a, were, were postponed, basically. And then in June, um, a, a similar direction came out, um, really issuing the same message. Now, what that meant was that lots and lots and lots of cases which had been listed right through that six-month period were now postponed. Uh, And obviously, when the system got up and running again, would be getting a degree of priority, meaning that Mm -hmm. they would be running from now, perhaps through until the early part of next year. But that meant that someone who had lodged a claim in or about March of this year could not possibly have that case heard for a minimum of a year. But the likelihood is, unfortunately, that it's going to be much longer longer than that. Presently, the tribunal is listing into December of next year and indeed into early 2022. Now, the the effect of that uh, is profound. Mm-hmm. Um, so someone who finds that they've been unfairly dismissed, um, uh, and, and we have to remind ourselves that the tribunals were set up as an informal, flexible means of redress, you know, of, of, of timely redress mm-hmm. in, in situations like that. It can't be timely redress if you're waiting a year or a year and a half. and the actual practical reality of it is that the pressure on that individual who's now out Mm -hmm. of a job um, and no quick means of redress Mm -hmm. may well mean that um, it's not an effective remedy. Yeah, and a uh, and it's a real. I I know that the tribunals recently have been looking at a number of mechanisms to try and um, improve the through flow and the, the uh, around listing and and various things, but. Unfortunately, the, the 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 physical parameters of the of the tribunal building and the sort of arrangements that are being in place uh, put in, in place also um, are um, understandably in, in, uh, to some extent uh, stringent. But I, I do feel that more needs to be done in terms of we're reducing now greatly the number of people who can attend in a tribunal room. Um, and it seems to me that the there there is a, a, a an onus then on the tribunal system to provide adequate mm-hmm. a, additional a, rooms so that fo- folk who have an interest in those proceedings can still quotes participate, a, you know, with their TV screen yeah. um, a, a, in a convenient manner, and and that arrangement isn't there. And um, and again, the tribunals, like much of the court system. Uh, uh, we have an open system of justice and mm-hmm. really any citizen is entitled, except in, in, in fairly uh, exceptional circumstances, to, to uh, take time out and go in and see justice being done if that's what they want yeah. to do. And, you, you, you know, I, I'd have real concerns around the current situation that that is a, that's not feasible at the current mm-hmm. time or, or it's not being it's certainly not being facilitated at the current time. And what's the impact the, the impact that that has maybe on, on both parties to that and what yeah. can they do? Is there anything practically they can do at the moment? Or I suppose if a claim arises, mm. would you advise your clients to take any other precautions or any way to mm. remedy it maybe? Well, look, 
the parties are always recommended to see if something can be resolved. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, you know, basically in any form of litigation, you know, if, if you if you literally have to end up in the courtroom or in the tribunal room, it's I suppose it's a failure of all of the other mm -hmm. attempts at resolution up to that time. Um, so. Uh, we have, uh, and it was unfortunate because it, it came into being just at the time that the pandemic struck. We have the new early conciliation process in tribunals, which allows a one month period for the parties, uh, you know, without going into a great deal of exacting detail to look and see, are there reasonable grounds okay. to resolve the matter? And, and anecdotally, from my perspective, that has been, you, you know, has been quite successful. But of course, that is not going to provide a long term solution mm -hmm. where there are real issues to be uh, considered on both sides. And and I mean, I've sp spoken about employees, but employers also of don't course. want a case hanging over for, yeah. for a year and a half. Uh, uh, and 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 why and why would they? So, y you know, um, uh, yes, one would encourage a uh, one would certainly encourage people where there is a genuine prospect of resolving it to get on with it and resolve it because that will certainly be your best yeah. uh, best plan for the next year and a half or so but that doesn't take away from the fact that I think uh, and if it's a question of resources then resources you know this is a service it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a courts and tribunal service and that service should be adapting uh, to the needs of key stakeholders in my view. Yeah absolutely and I mean this matter is not going to go away anytime soon as you just said some cases might not get listed then for hearing for until 2022 Absolutely. I mean that's extraordinary yeah. so whether the pandemic you know kind of starts to ease off over the next year which yeah. we hope it does and yeah. um, the long-term effect on yeah. proceedings and I mean do you think that this has changed the landscape maybe for for permanently I suppose in terms of the employment tribunal or has there been anything positive that came out of it I know in some um hearings remote hearings were actually have been carried out quite successfully and I know not everybody has mm -hmm. access to remote hearings but is there any way that you can see maybe in practice um, things changing permanently? Well, ironically, within the tribunal system, we already had a system whereby basically when you when you lodge your tribunal claim, um, you will then go into a fairly um, formal a uh, system where uh, the case will be case managed basically mm -hmm. up until the hearing uh, and that it, you would generally be at least one and there may be more what are called case management discussions now those are quite formally structured hearings which sort of decide what are the legal and factual issues what is the likely time scale how many witnesses will there be all the sorts of things that you need to get ironed out so that you can have a smooth running hearing at the end of it uh, ironically we already had those hearings okay. done remotely so um and of course, that's very sensible because there's a huge cost issue to you know going along to a tribunal for what is just a, a kind of interlocutory hearing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's difficult to see where the improvement can be around that. I I, I you, I'm old enough to remember a time when there was um, a, quite a significant backlog in the tribunals, and that was largely successfully addressed. So I think you know, you mm -hmm. know, there, there's going to be a, a, and there is an urgent need for additional resourcing. resourcing. Yeah. yeah, you couldn't. Yeah, I mean, that's very, very um, urgent, I yeah. suppose, to get yeah. that in place. So, I mean, that continues. And obviously the need for the tribunal and access to that service continues regardless of a, a tribunal. So it's just or regardless of the pandemic. So it's a matter of putting those recommendations in place. Um, so just moving on a little bit, um, we spoke um, in the introduction there about um, the, this year being the 50th anniversary of the Equal Pay Act. Um, 19, I think it was May 1970 <laughs> that um, the principal was given royal assent and very recently I watched the film Made in Dagenham yes. I don't know if you saw it but um, it was about obviously the machinists with Ford who really yeah. kick-started yeah. um, you know the campaign around this and I think they went on strike for quite a significant yeah. period and really drew attention to this fact um, so that's going back 50 years uh, this year it's celebrated and I mean, I think we can say that while the concept of equal work has been around for 50 years and that equal pay for equal work, and I, I'm familiar with it. Um, in reality, is this still an issue, Rosemary, that employers and employees are still trying to grapple with? How have things progressed? 
Well, <clears throat> I, I, I did. So I haven't recently seen Maiden Dagenham, but I've seen it several, uh, s- several times. Mm. And uh, it does, I think, in a very human way, uh, you know, focus on the lives of those women mm-hmm. and how much um, time and energy and everything else was consumed by that, that struggle of theirs, which was so important, mm-hmm. as, uh, as you rightly say. Th- the unfortunate thing is that uh, the gender pay gap you know, remains mm. stubbornly there. I, I um, was re- reflecting just bef- uh, before I, knowing that I was coming to, to speak to you today. And, uh, you know, at current uh, at current rates, apparently it'd be 270 years, you know, before, you know, there would be genuine pay equality. Wow. You know, I looked at that and thought maybe it was 27 years and then I saw it was 270. And I thought, you know, and, mm. y- you know, in a kind of um, joking way, I, I would have said to, clients coming in with an equal pay claim you know um you need to be resilient and you know you need to you need to be relatively young because mm-hmm. by the time this claim ends you know yeah. y- you know just to have the staying power for it um there there is a stubborn persistent difficulty around equal pay and um Yes, the Equal Pay Act has been there since 1970, but as anyone who's ever had the experience of uh, living through an equal pay claim will will know, it is possibly, in an area of employment and quality law, which is quite complex in any event, equal pay has to be at the very pinnacle of complexity. Mm -hmm. In terms of the different proofs that a a claimant has to establish in order even to (coughs) get to the stage where an an employer is called for an explanation. And so you could look at a situation and say, oh, that's that's that's, that's, that's clearly wrong. And yet the um, employee has to establish that they're genuinely doing work of uh, equal value. Um, And there's lots and lots and lots of um, contrary submissions that an employer can put up at that stage, um, and then they, you, you know that then they have to survive the test of whether or not there's a genuine material factor a uh, difference which would justify the inequality in pay. And I suppose one of the problems is that we still lack a, d- a, a significant degree of transparency. Yeah. It's still, still a lot of secrecy around still, data, and still yeah. a lot of secrecy around data. A lot of um, uh, you, 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 you know, un- unwillingness to, you, you know, whereas one would think, well, look, I mean, if if employers are, are confident that everyone's getting a fair crack of the whip, what is that secrecy mm-hmm. uh, around? Why is it so all pervasive and so persistent? And um, and the other thing is, and, and this would particularly apply to a small jurisdiction like ourselves, um, the, the, the difficulty for, for litigants is that you must put your head above the parrot. You, parrot, but you must um, launch those proceedings. And, you, you know, people in many walks of professional life may, may have a very valid, clear mm-hmm. claim uh, that there, there's inequality of pay. But they have to factor in, so I, so, I, so I go through this litigation, how does that affect, you know, if, if there's a complete breakdown, I can no longer work for this employer, mm-hmm. is, you know, am so I... So difficult. Y- yes, I mean, am I in some way tainted? You know, those yeah. are real concerns. Absolutely. I, I find, ironically, that uh, clients <coughs> come really at a stage when they're, when, when they're well through their career. And where that where that vulnerability isn't as acute as it would be, which is uh, which is all wrong because really yeah. where the, where the, where it needs to be tackled is early on. Is early on. But it's that fear it's that, that fear. people have, of course. Yeah, yeah. And it's understandable. And I suppose within any industry, mm. I remember recently, well, about a year or so ago, we had a roundtable discussion just with um, women lawyers in yes. the area. Yeah. It was held in the Canal Court in Uri and just certain issues were still coming yeah. up. But yeah. one of the, the um, factors that was brought up was when you first start your career in law, yeah. you don't want to rattle anybody's cage, cage mm-hmm. you know so whether you felt that you weren't being paid enough or you were being treated unfairly you weren't getting the same cases as your male mm-hmm. counterpart maybe they were getting you know more commercial mm-hmm. something that would progress them more and you were dealing with maybe the family stuff mm-hmm. or whatever it was mm-hmm. you know it was that kind of gender stereotyped um yeah. feeling as well that people had but you know the reluctance to say it and yes. then there were people who were more experienced and more mature there and they said well if that happened to me now I would have no issue in yes. bringing that to the fore so yes. you're right it's that sense of you know just kind of getting stuck in saying nothing and um, motoring through for fear of maybe losing your job or rattling any cages and yes. I think that's it's difficult for women and yes. it still continues today no doubt yes. oh, oh no oh no doubt no doubt
This podcast is sponsored by Granite Exchange. Do you need an office or a meeting room space? Granite Exchange is the ultimate serviced office and meeting room facility. Located in the heart of Newry City, it is perfectly placed between Belfast and Dublin. Each office suite is fully furnished and comes with an all-inclusive monthly fee with no long-term contract. All you have to do is show up and switch on. The rest is taken care of. For more information, call 028 3044 2500 or visit www.granite-exchange.com. So um, still a long way to go. I'm quite shocked by the 270 yes. years, but I can you can kind of see into it. And again, it's unfortunate that that secrecy, secrecy still exists. I know with certain companies, they have to disclose. I'm not sure what the um, conditions are, but they have to disclose right. their their pay um, gap and it, you know the, the pay between women and men. Um, is there a call for maybe that in the future to be a common occurrence with all companies, no I, matter I, what their size? Or? Yes, I think so because um, y- yes, the larger the larger uh, companies uh, have that requirement, but but it, 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 in particular in our jurisdiction, you know, we're mm. made up of small to medium sized sure. enterprises anyway, in large part. So, you know, um, if you're if you're genuine about wanting to uh, to deal with it, um, that's what you that's mm. what you would do. Um, it, it it's 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 also it just. Um, you know, in the way, as I said, I referenced earlier, you know, the, um, the, the the fact of religious and political discrimination in the workplace. And, you know, um, once that became a, a subject that was litigated a, openly and publicly, um, it, it, a, it, it became something that no one ever wanted effectively mm-hmm. to be, quote, accused of. Mm-hmm. Um, equal pay doesn't seem to have the same negative resonance you know right. and it just um it and it may be around that employers i mean just to, to, to go back to what you were saying that's a that's a comment you know so so an employer might say well you know um actually you know james and john are the are by a long t- uh, streak the, the the best fee generators here but mm-hmm. that as you rightly you know then you have to say well why is that mm-hmm. you know are they a uh, naturally innately more capable, better skilled, have they have the more relevant experience, or is it in the allocation of work? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and then so so when you're talking about work of equal value, yeah. are you uh, are you putting an unequal value uh, simply on fee generation, where mm-hmm. uh, and you're not looking at other things like raising the profile of the of the company, raising the level, uh, you, you know, showing that it's a, it's a it's a, it's a firm that has. A, a a expertise maybe some of that quotes women's yeah. uh, work is actually attracting in leveraging in other work i mean you know simply to to use to use a raw data like fee generation mm-hmm. doesn't really you know in my view uh, reflect the the, the 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 real import of the work that's Absolutely. done but it can provide a very clear it can provide a very easy you know, explanation. And I think it's an interesting study to mm. to take on mm. because, I mean, the group that I was in, there was quite a lot. There wasn't one person who hadn't noticed whether it was something that impacted them personally, but there wasn't one woman there who hadn't mentioned yeah. some form of, even if it's a feeling or not, it's still relevant. Yes. And it seemed to be those who worked with the larger firms, the top didn't really notice it as much as people who are in smaller to medium sized firms. Yeah. The, the real difference between the allocation of work and yeah. fee generation and their salary then. So, yes, I mean, yeah. <laughs> that that wasn't very long ago for me, but mm-hmm. I still I, I would have witnessed it um, back in Dublin um, when I first started out. But we spoke a little there about um, the gender pay gap. But. I'm wondering again, I mean, in the UK and in, in Northern Ireland in particular, around um, black and ethnic minority yeah. groups yeah. and, I mean, especially women and women with disabilities as well, yeah. who really still experience yeah. a huge discrepancy when yeah. it comes to pay. Yeah, oh, oh ab- absolutely. And, uh, you know, the Equality Commission itself the equ- and the Equality Coalition, which brings together a, a broader range of, of sectional uh, interests um, in, in repeated studies, um, they, 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 they have pointed to um, inequalities experienced by women, particularly women who are um, who have a small, who have dependents, be that mm-hmm. small, uh, 
uh, young children, I should say, uh, or because they're they're disproportionately represented in carers of yes. of, of, of elderly dependents, and so absolutely with women uh, women with disabilities. And yet, uh, I mean, I'm very glad to to, to um, spend some time looking at um, BMA groups because. You know, it, 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 it strikes me as well that, you know, society constantly evolves, you know, and, and you know, I, I look back at, at um, what the key priorities were when I would have started out. And, you know, you're right that in, in, in Northern Ireland, one of the big changes we have had, very positive change in my view, has been, you know, and I hope it is, I sincerely hope it is not desperately disadvantaged now with Brexit, but, you know, a, a steady influx of migrant uh, work from you know, from various parts, you know, mm -hmm. uh, um, and in particular areas, we can think of Moy Park, we can think of mm -hmm. other yeah. industries where, um, it, it, you know, predominantly these are people from particular, um, from particular countries. Um, and I think a question has to be asked, how well are those individuals in, um, enjoying what we all laud as diversity and inclusion? Mm -hmm. How is that actually, practically speaking, uh, you, you, you know, coming home to them in a sure. real way. At this stage, you would expect that proportionate to their representation in the workplace, uh, you, you know, and migrant workers would be reflected at every echelon, mm -hmm. right up into the top hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, then we have to ask ourselves serious questions. Yes. You know, it, it was unacceptable to have uh, inexplicable differences between Catholics and Protestants back in the uh, 70s, 80s, 90s. It should also be equally unacceptable mm -hmm. to have, you know, disproportionate representation just in the lower echelons and no explanation for why, uh, y y you know, as I say, representatives of migrant workers, some are into their second generation Absolutely. now. Why are those people not re reflected right throughout the hierarchy? Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I think that's uh, something that, that you, you know, research could and should focus uh -huh. upon, and um, and absolutely in t in t to look at the other um, categories that you were speaking of in terms of of women and women, um, a in all those categories uh, categories I spoke of, and women returning from maternity leave who find that their job has changed beyond yeah. recognition or is no longer there, and so on. Absolutely, and you know, again. If government's serious about uh, encouraging women to participate to the broadest extent possible in the workplace, then, you know, there are just innumerable recommendations around childcare, mm -hmm. around, um, a, you know, putting in subventions for people who are carers, people with disabilities, but they're not delivered on. They're not delivered. They're just not delivered no. on. And there's still campaigns. I can think of one called Flex Appeal in the UK mm -hmm. about flexible working for parents, get mm -hmm. whoever is the carer of the mm -hmm. children. But you're right. Um, if they're going to really, you know, put women um at the standard where their their you know their money where their mouth mm -hmm. is, basically, mm -hmm. yeah. they need to put practices in place, and they they aren't there yet. And yeah. I think for me, like all of us know about the childcare, really yeah. stands out. Yeah. You know, as one yeah. um real barrier at yeah. times as well, and the expense yeah. of that. Too. Yeah. So really, there's a long way to go, and it's clear that the campaign um, for I suppose not just equal pay, but all of these yeah. um, inequalities yes. and barriers to women and um, BME mm -hmm. people in the workplace, mm -hmm. you know, really need to be broken down. I wonder, um, in your opinion, how has coronavirus and the pandemic not to keep harking mm -hmm. back to that? Mm -hmm. But I think some aspects of it have really been brought to the fore in a positive way mm -hmm. where we have really been able to see again the barriers discrimination and inequalities that do exist yes. and have always existed that have been brought to the fore with um the pandemic yes. um so i mean just in your opinion how how is that um is how is that progressing the cause i suppose and is there anything really relevant that we should look at again yes what well, i mean there are obviously aspects um, of um, a, a move towards, um, you, you know, greater capacity for home working, mm -hmm. perhaps a flexible hybrid kind of, uh, you, you know, which you could see could assist 
y- you know, particularly women, um, to have a more flexible working day and so forth. Uh-huh. However, on the downside, um, you know, um, one reads a, a lot about women finding that this is in fact um, all of the burden, or disproportionately, sure. the burden is falling on them. The Absolutely. home, the homeschooling, the working from home, mm-hmm. the keeping everything else uh, at home going, uh, and trying to, to to do everything on top, and disproportionately, that is. Um, you know, a- a adversely impacting. It is. And I think just yesterday I read a report, I don't know whether you saw it, it was published on BBC, um, that the coronavirus pandemic, I'm just reading it out here, could wipe by 25 years of increasing gender equality. New global data from the um, U- United Nations suggests that women are doing significantly more domestic chores and family care because of the impact of the pandemic. Employment and education opportunities could be lost and women may suffer from poorer mental and physical health. Before coronavirus, for every one hour of unpaid work, work done by men three hours was done by women now that figure is higher so really I mean that was shared I think the women's council had shared that yesterday and it got um wide circulation but that's quite worrying but I suppose you can you can see it happening you know yes um and so (laughs) I mean maybe this is a step too far but do you think that this care burden on top of work um risks us maybe reverting back to that 1950s gender stereotypes that some women are now reporting when it comes to sharing the, the domestic work with their work at home? Oh, we, oh yes, I think so. And, you know, um, I, you, 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 you know, I, I think it's... Um, uh, unfortunately, a, a, a truism that you know when the when 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 you know the the space at home for the working from home and the, and the two uh, uh, partners are working from home, you know, um, it, it's generally you, you, you know the the male who commandeers the, the the most suitable space and will then you know continue to work on is the, the woman who will be left to fi- carve out her space yeah. somewhere else, uh, uh, and th- and there's actually no possibility of switching off at all b- no. because you move a uh, you, you know seamlessly from work uh, as in work to the domestic work and, and the and there's uh, no break uh, there's no break there isn't there's no break and I guess everybody's different and everybody has their own experiences but just in chat with mm. friends and people mm. who have been working from home mm. it seems to be the common complaint mm. that I'm coming across yeah. and I guess I'm lucky that we have the option here we're in a you know quite a large space and it was easy to maybe come mm-hmm. down when we could um, and when it, we were permitted to do so to do a few hours here if I mm-hmm. could escape the children mm-hmm. yes. <laughs> but it, yeah. it, it's tough to balance yeah. it and as you said I think it's the one thing you just do not switch off you don't get yes. that break at all mm-hmm. so and I know it, there's a lot of positive about flexibility I yes. think is a good thing mm-hmm. and that employers are tending to be more flexible around how um, carers work and you know so I mean that's a positive um, aspect but as you said we need to really look at it in, yeah. in detail and see in reality what's happening yeah. and to put a kind of some kind of protections in place I guess oh, completely and Possibly. employers need to remember you know that the duty of care mm-hmm. extends in the workplace and if the workplace is now the family home then that duty of care I mean much has been written about you know employers and that they need to you know monitor remote workers make sure they're working and you know all the rest equally they need to monitor that workspace and ensure that it is a healthy work environment I mean, you know, again, you, you know, mental health health issues are being flagged and mm-hmm. now is the time, not not later when some research talking, now is the time to engage with your employees in, in a really positive way and to ascertain that, you know, they are not being overwhelmed. And, yeah. and if they are, what do you as an employee, you, you know, in the same way as if they were physically there with you in the, sure. in the workplace? Yeah, so that duty of care mm-hmm. is ever more, you know, yeah. relevant now. Completely. You know, it's not a matter that people have just taken their computer home and that's sat right. at home to do their that, work. That, that's there's right. there's that burden there. So, gosh, so much to to get yes. your head around with employment yes. and equality. Well, and I suppose yes. I suppose you're working in a very exciting time. I mean, Rosemary, you yes. know, with with your area of yes. work and that's yes. your expertise. Yes. And I'd say your your services are quite yes. on demand, even yes. your information. And yes. um, so, really, just to to finish up the next year. Or so, how do you th- see things maybe progressing in terms of your area of work? Do you see anything, you know, quite new that we should look out for in employment and equality um, and keep an eye on um, anything yes. in particular? Yes. Well, I, yes, I, I do see a lot <laughs> of, 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 of work and busyness for, 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 for employment lawyers. I, I do think that equality issues are going to emerge 
particularly when the furlough scheme or the job support scheme or whatever iteration of it uh, finally fizzles out, you know, that, you know, uh, that will provoke, unfortunately, um, you, you know, a hard look at, at who's staying and who's going. Mm-hmm. I think equality issues will emerge sure. then. Um, I, I, I hope that people, you know, d- d- disabled um, employees uh, are aware of the safeguards and protections Older employees are aware mm-hmm. of the safeguards and protections. Um, migrant workers in uncertain status are aware, mm-hmm. even th- th- though y- you know much circumscribed of, of their rights and mm-hmm. protections. And I th- really do think that um, employers need to remind themselves of, of that last point I made about the duty of care and the need to ensure a healthy, including a mentally healthy working environment. Fantastic. Well, there's a lot there. That was so interesting. Um, Rosemary, thank thank you so much. Um, I learned a lot there and I'm sure our listeners did as well. Thanks again for coming in today. It's been great to have you. Thanks very much for the invite. Yeah, (laughs) we'll have you back again just to to touch base. Um, I'm sure we've a lot of new matters to contend with by then. Well, look, thank you listeners today um, for tuning in and join us again next week um, for our fifth episode on Activist Lawyer. And remember to have a look at our blog and if you want to contribute, Um, please do so it's activistlawyer.com thank you bye this podcast was recorded in Granite Podcast Studio interested in starting up your own podcast but don't know how Granite Podcast Studio can help record your podcast in our state of the art studio which is based in the heart of Newry City our studio has cutting edge and user friendly technology and can seat up to four people We also provide an editing service for our team using your guidance and editing notes to provide you with a flawless finished product, leaving your listeners wanting more. For more information on how you can get started, visit www.granitepodcaststudio.com.